Hey everyone, welcome back to CF's Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Babbitt, co-founder of the Challenge Athletes Foundation. It's my treat every week to get to meet one of our amazing challenged athletes. This week is no difference. Uh, 2020 Paralympian Danny Arovich joins us. Danny, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you so much for having me, Bob. I really appreciate it. Well, it's a, such a treat for me. And I'm looking at this going, okay, you, you ran at Butler University and obviously grew up as an, as an athlete and doing all sorts of sports, but you were never aware of Paralympic sports? No, never really growing up. I did receive in high school from the Paralympic track team, a like all American letter in the mail. And we tossed it because we thought it was <laughs> to the wrong people. <laughs> we just genuinely didn't know much about adaptive sports. And it wasn't really until after I graduated from college and was working full time that someone who was involved with CAF Idaho reached out to me and said I should look into starting to train and potentially try to make this a career. It's interesting because as somebody who was born with a limb difference, uh, the mm -hmm. reality is you just lived your life, right? You were playing mm -hmm. sports and going to school. And there was, Definitely. as far as you were concerned and your friends were concerned, you were just Danny. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so when you did find out, it, it's funny to me because then I look at it and go, okay, you find out about this stuff. And next thing you know, mm -hmm. not only are on August 27th, you're at <laughs> you're the first round of the 400 in the Paralympics in Tokyo. <laughs> But then you're coming home from there after mm -hmm. you know being at the Summer Paralympics. And they're like, hey, why don't you do some voiceover for the Winter Paralympics uh, that's going to air <laughs> during the Super Bowl? You're like, wait, wait, wait. I I'm not. Am I on the team? What, what? This all happened. It seems so fast. Yes. It's basically my training and qualification. I started training in January of 2019. So I'm just about two and a half years into my journey and yes, already went to a summer Paralympics and now trying to prep for hopefully making the winter Paralympic team this upcoming March. That is so funny. And they're so different because you're talking the quarter yeah. mile is uh -huh. 63 seconds. And then how yeah. long are when you're talking paranordic and parabiathlon? Those are a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, from about a kilometer skiing to 15 kilometers. So much different um, endurance system needed, obviously, a totally different types of worlds. People often think when I say that I ran track and now I'm doing Nordic, that the two would be very comparable and help each other out. And I was like, actually, I felt like the two kind of clashed together this summer. So I had a quite interesting summer trying to figure out how to balance track training, but also not put myself so far behind because of the quick turnaround to Nordic. What was the experience like in Tokyo for you? Now, obviously not your typical Paralympics because the fans yeah. are there, but still it's the Paralympics and you're wearing your, your, your uh -huh. country, uh, USA on your chest. That had to be pretty special. It was really cool. And it was my first time internationally competing for track since I ha am so new to the Paralympic world. And just seeing like, Finally, all these other people from all the different countries, like it makes me realize how big our adaptive community, obviously not just in the US, but worldwide is because again, like growing up, I didn't know many people with disabilities. I didn't know anyone who looked like me. So it's just been in the past few years that I've discovered I'm actually one of many, whereas my entire childhood, I thought I was solo basically in this. <laughs> Did you deal with bullying or any of that type of stuff growing up or were you, was it you know, be pretty regular childhood. I'm very lucky that the community I grew up in in Boise, Idaho was very small. And I went to the same school with kids from kindergarten through the end of high school. And so it's definitely always when you meet someone new, especially as a kid, it's dealing kind of with the awkwardness of like, you don't have to stare at me. I know I look different. Um, I know this is going to take some time for you probably to feel comfortable and me to feel comfortable talking about it. But luckily my community, like since I met them at such a young age and then I grew up with them, I again was just treated as one of many instead of being singled out or sold out as being different. Um, I almost probably had the opposite problem sometimes instead of having bullying, I had a lot of people come up you know, during sports and playing able-bodied sports saying, you're such an inspiration. You're such an inspiration. Yeah. And as a kid, I was just like, 
so frustrated with that. I was wanted to be like, no, I'm not. I'm just doing what your kid's doing. I just look a little different doing it. And so that I'd say was probably the thing that bothered me the most growing up. And again, to no fault of the individuals, they think they're being kind and right. they were, but just as someone who has that difference, it gets so tiresome to hear over and over again that you doing normal activities is inspirational. Well, and you look at, uh, when you look at track, obviously that's a perfect mm-hmm. sport, right? It really doesn't, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're not throwing the javelin or anything. So it's, it's not that yeah. big a deal. But when you start talking Nordic, and you're uh-huh. talking, people are polling and that's a different uh-huh. gig, right? Have you found yeah. that it's more limiting there than it was as a track athlete? Yes and no. So in running, when I ran distance in college, I definitely think that I didn't notice a huge difference with missing my hand as compared to the other athletes. And I did compete at a division one level. Um, and my coach, honestly, before I even showed up, didn't know I was missing my hand. Cause he just looked at my times. We talked on the phone and it just never came up. <laughs> what did he say when he first saw it? He did again, kind of one of the awkward things where it's like, they don't know what to say. And so I tried to like welcome the conversation, but it was, it was pretty hilarious that, yeah, he really had no idea that I was missing my hand. That is hilarious. Um, but, but realistically, yeah. times are times. It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. And that's what's easy about cross country and track and field is you can really just compare a time. Yeah. I did notice when I started running the 400, like, I think that's why my classification did have the 400 at the games is I think with sprinting, particularly it does somewhat inhibit just your ability to produce particularly power through your Mm. arm motion. And, um, people who are amputees, like typically then because of our imbalance, we might be rotating our chest a little much, which might waste some energy, but with cross country skiing, if you put me up against an able-bodied skier, I would say they have the advantage using two pools. Absolutely. But luckily for parasport, um, if anyone has an arm impairment, they only are allowed to use one pole. So not per, people aren't getting like an advantage over the other mm-hmm. in parasport. Um, but yes, like for example, last weekend I did some able-bodied races and I, I truly got beat by a lot by them, but um, I'm taking it and I appreciate skiing against the able-bodied skiers because I think long-term it will help me more in being a greater skier in para. Perfect. So be, growing up in Boise, seeing mm-hmm. CAF come up there and mm-hmm. become such a big part of the community, both in winter yeah. sports and summer sports, that has to be pretty cool for you. And you guys are sort of the hub of adaptive sports now. Yes. So I think that it was just about when I started learning about parasport as a whole, when someone talked to me about CAF Idaho and the fact that Idaho of all states had its own (laughs) sector of CAF was really cool. And now that I'm a few years into my involvement, I just love being able to not only represent the CAF organization as a whole, but getting to represent the state of Idaho also and getting to work in the community, getting to represent Idaho and CAF and seeing all the great things that they are doing in the state of Idaho and all of the great things that are to come in the next few years that are really going to help elevate our challenge athletes in this state and the surrounding states. So with the parallel, with the Beijing coming up, quickly uh-huh. right in March yes <laughs> I'm sure you're all systems going did you were you able to take a break at all after summer before going oh wait a second that's done Tokyo's done Beijing yeah. now is, is all gas full, full on I took about a three-week break in between getting fully back into ski training and coming home from Japan I had to do some like personal things do some go to some weddings uh move actually and then I actually got LASIK eye surgery as well so I took some time to do those things but I can't really sit still so I still trained just a little lighter and on kind of uh not on my team's program but I was definitely still exercising and training just not with the team and then as soon as October 1 hit I was full on with the team going to training camps um, doing all of the team 15 to 20 hours a week of training for Beijing. So I also look at you, you're doing photography. And when you, when you pick 
when you pick I her. Tried. Some, <laughs> you tried to but doing that with 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 one with one hand, that is yeah. that is tough, right? <laughs> I mean, yes, I definitely have to take probably more advantage of things like tripods and some other tools that able-bodied um, photographers and artists might not need to. But I have been picking up a camera since I was early on in high school. So I've definitely started to get more comfortable. And um, yes, I am jealous of people who have two hands that can hold us, particularly a longer lens, a little bit easier yes. than me. But we figure out ways around it. <laughs> So I, I saw you in a Nike basketball commercial. You've done a, a campaign for, <laughs> yeah. for backcountry and others. Modeling, is that, that's obviously a passion as well? Yes, and I never thought that that would be something I would do. And it kind of came along with when I started training for Paralympic sport, um, because prior I was typical nine to five corporate employee, go to work, come home from work, et cetera. And so when I started training and um, I had some opportunities arise with modeling, I was kind of shocked because I was somewhat like, why would you want to pick me for this? And um, I always loved, like, my mom was a photographer. I always loved her taking my picture and things like that. But it's been really great to, first off, see that brands are willing and welcoming to be including as part of their diversity, people mm -hmm. who look different physically, whether it's an amputation, someone who uses a wheelchair, et cetera. So it's been really inspiring to see that these companies and these brands are taking the steps to try to be more inclusive. And it's been just really awesome to, yeah, get to see something come out and know that maybe a kid somewhere who has never seen someone who looks like them might see this ad or this magazine article or something or other and say like, oh, wow, there actually is other people like me. So it's that's probably my favorite part about doing things on the modeling track. Has there been a favorite CAF moment so far at one of the clinics or camps or? Ooh. <laughs> I would say right after I started my Nordic career, yeah. just two months in, CAF Idaho hosted a biathlon clinic and it was hosted um, at Tamarack Resort, which is outside of McCall, Idaho. And I got to go for the weekend and it was great to get to come back from Idaho because I was living in Salt Lake City at the time for training. And I got to see my head developmental coach from the U.S. Paralympics Nordic Ski Team. And it was my first big CAF event that I really felt a part of. And so to get to meet tons of other people from Idaho who had disabilities, get to be on snow in a beautiful place. And anytime I get to hang out with one arm, Willie is gonna be a good time. So any event that I get to see him at, I always love to. So that's probably been my favorite CAF moment thus far. There's Willie actually was at our first ever San Diego Triathlon Challenge and we started 28 years ago for, for Jim McClure. Oh my gosh. He, <laughs> he, has been, he has been the pioneer because yeah. back in the day, Definitely. if he wanted, they didn't have a, a prosthetic arm. So if he was mm -hmm. riding his bike, he had a ride with one arm and 50 mile an hour winds and figure out how yep. to drink water, <laughs> eat food, hold on to the bar. He was the ultimate. Have you ever driven with him? You ever driven where Willie's driving the car and he's. I have not. Yeah. Well, trying to do the phone <laughs> and driving and yeah. It's, save oh, yourself yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimate I think my mom would say the same thing about me because I always use my left arm to steer while yeah. I eat or do something yeah. on my phone and she goes you have one hand please use it when you're driving the vehicle <laughs> I'm like so that I'm thing, fine <laughs> yeah that is really cool we got four members of the U.S. Paralympic Nordic skiing national team attempting yeah. to qualify for Beijing after competing uh -huh. in Tokyo Oksana Masters, Kendall yeah. Gretsch, Aaron Pike, yourself that is so cool. It used to be if someone had a medal from winter and summer that was like mind boggling. Now yeah. it seems like you guys Becoming, move from one yeah. to the other pretty seamlessly. Yes. And I mean, I definitely knew this would even be possible because I got to see people like Oksana and Kendall do it since they've been involved a lot longer. When I was training for track and field and I was reached out to about trying out Nordic. I almost shut down the idea immediately because who, you know, you only have four years, 
how would I be able to juggle two different things? And it was really Oksana and Kendall who inspired that in me and gave me hope that like this could be a possibility. And having now four of us to represent all from Nordic and Aaron and I both did track, obviously, yes, Kendall with triathlon and Oksana with cycling. So to have four of us from the same team who are doing this, I think speaks volumes also to our Nordic program and our coaches willingness and love that we are able to diversify and not just be one sport athletes. And I hope other winter and summer sports can follow suit. Obviously it's not for everyone because again, little rest time has yeah. to change focuses, you know, every six months, but I think it keeps things interesting. And I think even someday I might try a different summer sport. So. I, I was thinking <laughs> your triathlon might be a really good thing for you. I was thinking. I, like, yeah. You, I was considering yeah. some things. <laughs> that, would be, that would be pretty fun. But so have you been working, taking any French lessons? Because we're only three years away from Paris, right? I know from Paris. I um, grew up actually speaking a little bit of French and I studied abroad while I was in college in Geneva, Switzerland, which is a French speaking region. Um, I would have to brush up on my French because it's probably been a few years and the most I could probably do is order and ask where the bathroom is right now. But I think <laughs> Paris would be definitely an ultimate goal of mine also because like the city itself is so incredible and I can't even imagine what an incredible Olympics and Paralympics they'll put on. And I'm really excited for that Paralympic Olympic cycle and having then the 28 games in Milan. So I think it will be a really cool few year cycle there. Look at you thinking ahead already. I like it. <laughs> I'm such a planner. <laughs> you got to be planning. And there's, the cool part is, I mean, there's a good chance we're going to see adaptive surfing in for 2028 uh -huh. in LA. And just they keep adding fun sports and it keeps getting yeah. better and better and better. Now, do you see with, with Para Nordic and with Para Biathlon, there's more metal opportunities, right? Than just in, yeah. in track and field, they keep cutting we have 100 and 400, and then they got rid of the 200. So there's not as many yeah. opportunities there as, as there is in Paranordic and Parabiathlon. Yes. So if I qualify for Beijing, I will most likely be doing three cross-country races and three biathlon races, and then there'd be two relay opportunities. Oh, my God. So it could be yeah. eight races? Potentially. Most likely six or seven, but Still. potentially, yes. Yeah, some of our athletes will be doing eight. That is unbelievable. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Danny, it's it is really such, cool. It's such a treat to get to know you. you know, I love what you Thank bring, your, your you. energy, your excitement for the sports. And I love yeah. everything happens so fast. It, I know. Probably one of those people. It's a whirlwind. <laughs> because the Paralympics was, and the Olympics were moved back a year, that might have oh, yeah. worked in your favor, right? The fact that. I think it did. Uh, because if I had, if Tokyo hadn't been delayed, I would have tried to qualify in a year and a half, which would have been a tight timeline, really tight. a really tight timeline. Yeah. And like, I was even lucky to get classified prior and they're yeah. just the amount of race opportunities. So while I didn't get to really race in 2020, it also helped first expose me then to the potential of dual sport and learning how to train for two different things at the same time. So while obviously we don't wish it ever had to no. be delayed, we're trying to see the positive sides that who knows? Yeah. If I hadn't had that extra year, maybe I wouldn't have qualified for Tokyo or maybe I would have qualified for Tokyo, but not been able to qualify for Beijing. So trying to look on the positive side about Always it. Always <laughs> the positive. That's why it's so yes. cool. We, we lost a year, it took five years to get to Tokyo, but now there's yes. only three years to Paris, which is the positive yes. side of that. See, we, yes. we're in the same wavelength <laughs> here, Danny. And I, oh, I, I like how you, you know, the, the one arm Dan, that, that, <laughs> that is very cool. Obviously you, you, Thank you. You enjoy life and you're doing yeah. great stuff. Danny, thank best of luck with all your you. training and thank you for all your support of CAF thank Idaho. You. Jen and her team are doing great stuff up there. Of course. Of all course. Right. Thank you so much for having me. Danny Arovich has been our guest. Again, CAF's Heroes of Sports. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. See you, Danny. <laughs>